number 350, in hardback hymnal number 350. It's wonderful to see everyone here this morning on this cold, snowy, icy, some kind of wintry weather morning, but it's glad to see everyone who can make it out. We've got a pretty extensive prayer list. We want to remember Clint Meek, Anthony Miller, Jennifer Miller, Doris Miller, Zora Robbins, Sherry Mink, Bob League, Pat Rader, Eliza Argenbright, Ron Argenbright, Carol and Peggy Hamilton, Kim Hickey, Bonnie Kirby, Andy Davidson, Brandy Meese, Clara Wilson, Diana Bennett, Maddie Wheat, Juanita and Coleman Dethridge, Peachy Boone, Polly Lucas, Virgie Cleghorn, Keith Cleghorn, Jean Botkins, Joyce McComb, Caden Bailey, Wanda McFerrin, David Rao, Tracy Rao, Brandon Phelan, Donnie Thacker. And we want to remember the family of May Rigsby. So we got a pretty extensive list this morning. We want to keep all them in our prayers. And all those who are out on the roads and the winter weather coming in. So we'll get the first, second, and fourth verse of number 350. First, second, and fourth. My lady son is sinking fast.
great to be at the house of the Lord this morning and to be with brothers and sisters in Christ uh, to worship God in spirit and in truth and hopefully uh, you count it a blessing to be able to be here this morning to worship God because uh, this is our duty and uh, this is something that we should look forward to and look forward to with uh, great excitement and uh, uh, great expectation even though uh, we wasn't there when the Lord was crucified you know, we can kind of go through, uh, as we take the Lord's Supper, we can kind of remember just some of the things that he suffered. Because as I have these things written here on the board, as we find in Matthew 26, 27 through uh, 28, we find these things outlined. And uh, we find a brief description of what all of these mean. The word bread means loaf, and that means just one piece of bread, unbroken. And it comes from the Greek word artos. And the word blood uh, represents the, the fruit of the vine, which is in the cup that we drink, and it comes from the Greek word ganema. And the cup represents the New Testament, and it comes from the Greek word pokerion. And uh, the blood uh, that we have, or the blood that was shed there that day, ratified this ordinance. It ratified or it sealed, it made good, it made it right in the eyes of God. The blood of Jesus that was uh, sacrificed that day, it made it good, it made it right. And uh, because it did make it right and it sealed it, that means that it cannot be changed. Once something has been sealed, it cannot be changed unless our Lord changed it. But he didn't change it, he, he gave it to us to follow and to obey. And we find in 1 Corinthians 11 and 20 what this is called. And I know some people call it communion, but communion is the act that we perform when we break of the loaf and we drink of the cup. It is called, we find in 1 Corinthians 11 and 20, the Lord's Supper. It is called the Lord's Supper, and that's what we are to call it today. And uh, the communion is the act that we perform when we take of that cup and we eat of that bread. So uh, it's a big difference, and uh, we need to continue to call it what the Bible teaches, that it is called in God's holy word. And if we do that, we know that we are pleasing in God's sight and that we're performing the act which God said that we are to obey. We find what happened to Nadab and Abihu in Leviticus 10, 1 and 2, when they offered a strange fire unto God, how that that strange fire that they offered unto God consumed them because they got the fire from a place which God had not authorized. And we today still are to follow this pattern. We are today are still to follow this pattern just as the Bible teaches so that we can be pleasing in God's sight and we know the sacrifice that we offer up to God is going to be what he has ordained or what he has appointed. And this, as Christians, should be something that we look forward to each and every Lord's day. We should look forward to being able to do this and do it exactly as our Lord authorized it 2,000 years ago and should never have a desire to change it as many men have today. And because of it, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11 and 2, he said, I praise you not for this. He said, I praise you not because you have changed the ordinances. And the, uh, and the early church here at Corinth had made a meal out of it uh, because of the way that they were taking the Lord's Supper. Many today uh, may have been the right frame of mind, but they're not following the pattern. They're not following the pattern that God has authorized, and because of it, then they're not pleasing in God's sight. We have to do what God says the way God says to do it. And uh, if we do it any other way, then we're doing it in a way that God is not pleased. This morning we're going to look at the Lord's Supper and see what the Bible teaches about it so that we can make sure that this pattern continues to be handed down from generation to generation without change because it is important that we continue to follow the patterns outlining God's word when it comes to salvation. You know, we do, do not cut out any of the uh, conditions that it, meant, that it takes to be saved. 
why should we change the pattern that God has given us to obey him when it comes to worshiping him? But now, as always, it is a privilege to be able to go to God in the word of prayer. We always have many things to be thankful for. Many people have requested our prayer, so let's make sure that our mind is in the right place as we humble ourselves now. <laughs> God and our Father in heaven, we thank you for blessing us with this day. We thank you, God, for all the blessings you give us each and every day. We thank you for our health. We thank you for your love. And we thank you for your son, Jesus, who died on the cross for our sin. We have to forgive us of our sin. We thank you for each one that come here this morning to worship you in spirit and truth. That we chose your house to be at this morning. We're so thankful for you blessed us this day. We thank you, God, for everything you do for us, for our homes, for our food, for Pray that we will not forget to thank you as often as we should. We know you're the one that we owe everything to. We have nothing without you. We have to bless each one of us. We're so thankful to come out to your house this morning. We are the brothers and sisters in Christ. To worship you in spirit and truth. Sing songs and praise your holy name and hear another lesson from your word. We have to bless and be with the brother that we got him as he preached your word to us this morning all the brethren that challenge through this world. We pray for their safety and their family's safety. That they'll continue the good work. As many souls will be saved. We pray this morning for the sick. There are many, wherever they may be, nursing home, at their home, hospital, and the brothers and sisters that can't be out this morning worship you. We pray for them to <coughs> ask you to be with them and to be thy will. Restore their health back to them. And the families that's lost love be with them, comfort them in the way you know best. We pray that everything we do and say here this morning will be pleasing to you. We will follow your word. We will not add to or take away. And when we're with our friends and with our family, we will not forget your word and always make sure we follow it, not give in to them and say things are okay when it's not. We pray that be with all the little children, and many of them is being mistreated. We just pray that you'll be with them, and everybody will look out for them, and love them, and care for them, and teach them about you. We pray for the one here this morning that has obeyed your gospel. He will come forward and do so this morning. And for any one that has obeyed the gospel and has turned away from it, they'll make things right before they leave here. We ask you to bless us all and watch over us and keep us safe. Christ's name we pray. Amen. <laughs> number 288. We'll sing the first and last verse of number 288. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing?
One, two, zero will be the next song, the song of invitation. If you want to turn in your hymn books and be ready to sing in just a short while, uh, I tell you, I got my rubber boots in the back of the car, my long handles on this morning, so I'm prepared for anything, I hope. But uh, it is, uh, it is uh, a great opportunity to be here and just to tell you just a little about the congregation at Yalla Banks, that they are an energetic, uh, enthusiastic group of people. There's not many there, but their desire is to worship God in spirit and in truth. And uh, uh, their zeal for God and their love uh, for the work for the Lord, it, you know, it is wonderful. And uh, 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 it was a really a treat to be able to go over there and spend uh, the afternoon with them and uh, worship with them, but we sure miss being here and uh, uh, being with the church here at Chester Ridge. But uh, as we find here, once again in our reading from Matthew, the 26th chapter, we find how that Jesus himself, it says, and as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it. Jesus himself uh, followed the same pattern that we follow. Jesus himself took the bread, he blessed it, just as we do every Lord's Day morning, and we follow that same pattern that he instituted, that he gave to his disciples. We follow the same pattern because we believe this is the right thing to do. We find in John 19 and 33, when they came to Jesus, the soldiers, to uh, see if he was dead or not, because at that period of time it was getting close to... Uh, uh, the Sabbath day, they would uh, break the, uh, those that were on the, the cross there that had been uh, uh, crucified. They would break their legs or break their bones. But when they came to Jesus, he was already dead. So we find here that they did nothing to him. They did not break a bone of his body. That's what the loaf represents is the body of Jesus, a non-broken state. And uh, that's what the word artos, that's where we get that word. Jesus' body was not broken physically. It was only broken in death. That is, his spirit was separated from his physical body. And uh, that was the only way it was broken. But we find here this represents his physical body. And, uh, and because it does that, that's the way that we uh, observe the Lord's Supper. We continue to follow that pattern. And as we find in 1 Corinthians 10 and 16, the bread which we break, and that is a command for each and every one of us. Each and every one of us partake in the breaking of bread. That's what communion means, means joint participation. Every one of us are to join in and breaking this bread and drinking from this cup. We all participate in this if we're faithful Christians and our minds in the right place. And it should be, if we're doing this, it needs to be in the right place. It needs to be upon that sacrificed body that was there for me and you. And we don't need to be looking out the windows. We don't need to be worrying what go is going on after church or before church or whatever. Our minds need to be focused upon that sacrificed body that was shed there or forgive, given for me and for you. This is the place where it needs to be. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11 and 23, For I have received of the Lord, which also I have delivered. Paul said, What I received from heaven, and we find in 2 Timothy 3, 15 through 17, that all scripture is given by the inspiration of God. This was given to Paul from the Lord, or through the Holy Spirit, it was given to him, and he said, this is the pattern which I have delivered. The very same thing that I got from Jesus, he said, I give to the church at Corinth, and it also gives to us today. And we find in 2 Corinthians 5 and 7 that we walk by faith and not by sight. So we know what the Apostle Paul received was this very pattern this very pattern that we continue to follow each and every Lord's day. And when we do that, we know that we're pleasing in the eyes of God. David said long ago in Psalms 119, 104, he said, I hate every false way. Every false way that has been invented by man, he said, I hate them. And as Christians, 
We have to learn to hate every false way. We have to learn to hate every false pattern. When we know that it's false, we have to stand against it, even though sometimes it, it may uh, cause our circle of friends to become smaller. It may, uh, it may, it may cause those that, uh, that we think that are our friends, they may not be as close as we thought that they were because they may not be willing to accept that pattern because we're going to try our very best to only accept those things that we can read and prove and those that have been handed down from our Lord. And as we find in Matthew 26 and 27, it says, And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink you all of it, or all of you drink of it. And this is what they did. They all drank from that one cup, and uh, whether that cup was stainless steel or ceramic or a wooden bowl, we don't know. But... Uh, we know that they drank from a cup that represented the New Testament. We know that they drank from that. And that's what a drinking vessel is. Uh, is something that uh, we find here it comes from the Greek word poterian, and uh, it means a drinking vessel. And uh, when uh, Jesus uh, blessed this cup, they all drank from it as they had been commanded because they wanted to do like their Lord. You know, I ask you this morning, don't you want to do like your Lord? Don't you want to follow the pattern that was given to you by your Lord? And we find in Jude 3 where it says to earnestly contend for the faith. You know, this is part of the faith. This was part of the faith that was given to us by our Lord. And uh, we are to continue to follow in the patterns. You know, this is just not talking about salvation this is talking about every ordinances that was given by Jesus Christ. We're to earnestly contend for it. We're to earnestly contend for this word which was given one time by Jesus through the apostles. We find that we're to earnestly contend for that and not to be deceived into thinking that we can change it and it will be the same. You know, I, uh, we, you know, we all drive different vehicles. You know, I might be happy to trade uh, my car that's got 140000 for yours that's got ten because they're all cars. You know, I might feel pretty good about that, especially if you're driving a, a BMW or a Jaguar or something like that. I might feel pretty good about that, but it wouldn't be the same. And when we try to say that uh, individual cups or crackers or other things on the Lord's table is the same, you know, we're only fooling ourselves because we're not fooling God and we're not earnestly contending for the faith. We're allowing ourselves to be deceived into thinking that, uh, you know, that it's all right because our mind is in the right place. You know, that's not the case. Paul says in 1 Corinthians, or 1 Corinthians 11 and 29, he said, because some of you have left the faith, we find here, for he that drinketh eateth and drinketh unworthily, that means in a way that's not right in the eyes of God, eateth and drinketh damnation unto himself, not discerning the Lord's body. So we have to be careful. We have to be careful how that we take of this cup and that we take of this loaf. We must make sure that we do it the way the Bible teaches. And anybody that... Uh, causes division we find in 1 Corinthians 1 and 10 is doing something that is wrong and it doesn't matter who it is doesn't matter how good it sounds whenever we divide the church by thing, by innovations that have came, came down the pike from mankind you know it's not right and the church here was divided over who baptized them and Paul said you know you are all baptized in the name of Jesus. You know, don't be following some man, some man or uh, some woman today. Follow Jesus. Follow his word. Follow his teaching. Don't allow yourself to be deceived into thinking uh, that division is right, that all these things going on in the world in the name of religion, that it all came from God because it didn't. All of these things didn't come from God. God has been silent about his word 
for nearly 1,900 years. He's not spoken to man. He didn't. Re he's not revealed to man that it's all right to use individual cups on the Lord's table. He's not revealed to man that it's all right to use crackers or some other type of uh, bread on the Lord's table. He's not revealed that. He stopped revealing to man 1,900 years ago. And because of it, we have God's word to follow, and uh, this is what we should be following. We find in Hebrews 11 and 4, we find that uh, Abel's offering was accepted because he offered by faith. Cain's was rejected because he didn't offer by faith. They both had the opportunity to offer unto God something that God had commanded or God had authorized. But Cain wanted to offer something from the ground, and God rejected it. God rejected it because he didn't offer by faith. The Bible says in Romans 10 and 17 that faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. They both heard, get this, they both heard the same thing. But one tried to offer something God did not command while the other offered by faith or he offered what God had said and because of it his offering was accepted. We know that our offering is going to be accepted because we're offering by faith. We're offering by something that we can contend for. That is, that we can prove, according to the scriptures, just exactly what the Bible teaches. And because of it, we're offering by faith. And we're not just going on an opinion or what somebody thinks, but we're offering by faith. And because we're offering by faith, we know that it's going to be pleasing in the eyes of God. And this should be important to every Christian today is that uh, what we offer to God is pleasing to God. This should be important to us. And we find in Acts 20 and 7 that they did this upon the first day of the week. Many scholars have said that they did it upon the first day of every week. Not only does Jesus say it, and the Apostle Paul said, but all the scholars that, that write about the time of the church history in the beginning said all the, the churches that were following Christ, the sect, the, those that were in the way, they worshiped every first day of the week. They did this every first day of the week. It says here upon the first day of the week when they came together to break bread, that's what they called it, breaking bread, Paul preached unto them. So we know breaking bread and preaching is two different things. And this is what Paul did as he preached unto them. And uh, he goes on to say for in 1 Corinthians 11 and 26, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. So by doing this every first day of the week, we do show the Lord's death or that we do show that we believe that the Lord is coming back. This is before us every first day of the week. This continues to help us to remain faithful as we go forward in our life to remain faithful to God and to remember what God did for us and what God's Son was willing to do for us. And this is the reason that we continue to put this before us. And as long as we continue to put this before us, we're not going to forget it. You know, if we were laying it to the side maybe once every month, after a while it might be once every three months and once every six months and then once a year. But as long as we keep it before us, we're not going to forget it. We're not going to forget it or try to change it because we realize just how important it is and just how, we need, how much we need this every first day of the week so that we can continue to focus upon what Jesus did for us, each and every one of us, so that we could be pleasing in the eyes of God. We find in 1 Corinthians 11 and 24, where Paul, uh, remembering what Jesus did, he says, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which was broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And he goes on to say, After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, Jesus himself, Jesus himself here, we find Jesus himself broke of that bread 
and he also supped of that cup that was there on the Lord's table before he handed it to his disciples. So we can see here just the, the way that Jesus did this is the way that we do this every Lord's Day morning. And we find here that it is to show that we are New Testament Christians, that we are following Christ and the new covenant, that we are his disciples and we are following the pattern which he instituted. And this is the reason today we need to continue to do this and to continue to remember our Lord and the sacrifice that he made for us on Calvary's cross. And as long as we continue in this pattern, we're going to be able to do this. But many men today have went about to try to deceive and to uh, uh, making people think that the individual cups, whether it be uh, G.C. Brewer in 1948 when he introduced individual cups to the church in uh, Chattanooga, Tennessee, you know, he said that, uh, he said, I solely alone have uh, did this, caused this uh, uproar in the church. And he said, many, many uh, brothers and sisters fought me hard over this, saying that it was wrong. But he said, I kept pushing and pushing till they can f finally, many began to accept this pattern of many individual cups and many loaves on the Lord's table. Yes, he deceived many people into thinking that it would be all right. Those same people, they would never, they would never allow themselves to be baptized in tomato juice or uh, uh, orange juice or some other liquid. All they say, it has to be water. But those same people will allow themselves to drink from individual cups, eat crackers, or take crackers on the Lord's table, but none of them would allow themselves to be baptized in tomato juice or orange juice or, or some other liquid. And you know why? Because the Bible says we have to be baptized in water. But the Bible also says that we are to drink from one cup, that we are to break from one loaf. Yes, it's sad. It's sad when people allow themselves to think that uh, uh, there is germs that uh, man has invented. You know, God created everything in the beginning. There's been germs for 6,000 or 7,000 years upon this earth. And there are going to be germs when we die. But the thing about it is, there's a lot of germs that are good. A lot of people don't know that. There's a lot of germs that do a lot of good things. And if it wasn't for germs, uh, the things that we see that die on the road, they never decay. And a lot of other things that are out there that, uh, you know, they serve a purpose. But I can tell you, when you do this just the way God says it, you're the safest person here on this earth. You're the safest person here upon this earth. The CDC, over the last 100 years, has never been able uh, to detect anything from this cup. Even a day after, they've done studies, and they said what was left in the cup was sterile, that it couldn't multiply. And... Uh, uh, they said in all of their times of studying this, the CDC said there's never been one case traced back to the single cup or the loaf. You know, that tells me that's pretty safe. That tells me that's pretty safe. God knew what he was doing. God knew what he was doing when he instituted this. Man has come along and tried to... Uh, Deceive us into thinking that, oh, it's not safe. Or it, it don't look safe because of the microscope. You know, m my, the man couldn't see the germs that God created if God didn't want him to. It, do, it wouldn't matter what kind of microscope that he had or the telescopes that sees the stars far out into the, the future. If it wasn't for God placing all of these in a pattern, Man couldn't tell the seasons, the time, or nothing else. But God has placed everything in a pattern, 
And all of these things follow that pattern. All of these things follow that pattern, and they still do today. Luke says in Luke 22 and 20, the cup is the New Testament in my blood. This cup on the Lord's table, we find every Lord's Day morning is a symbol of that testament. It is a symbol of that testament. And when we drink from that cup, we're showing the Lord that we really do, be do believe that this pattern is safe. Not only is it safe, it is right. It is right. And we show our faith by continuing in this pattern. You know, how can we say that we're worshiping God in spirit and in truth when we allow innovations into the church? How can we say that as it says in John 4, 23 and 24? It says, the Lord seeketh those that will worship him in spirit and in truth. That's who God wants. That's who God is seeking today is those that still desire that, that uh, worship in spirit and in truth. And when we change, when we allow innovations to come into the church, whatever it is, however small, no longer are we worshiping the Lord in truth. When we change the patterns, whatever it may be, Paul says, I praise you not in that. I praise you not in changing uh, uh, the patterns which God has given us. And he rebuked the church for changing what God has said. That's the reason that David said we have to learn to hate every false way. And when we learn to hate every false way, you know, we're not going to allow things uh, of mankind to enter into the church. Because we know that it won't be pleasing in the eyes of God. All we have to do is look at the history uh, of, of, of the church and look at what went on and how that God rebuked those that fell to obey his word. And when we look at that, we can understand how important it is to continue this pattern. Jesus even said in Mark 14 and 25, I will drink no more of the fruit of the vine until I come into my kingdom. So we see here Jesus himself drinking of the fruit of the vine. Jesus himself following this same pattern, following these same, same word. This is the reason uh, Paul writes to the church at Philippi, we are to be of the same mind and of the same judgment. You know, we can't do that if we're divided. We can't be of the same mind. We can't have the same judgment. We can't have the, the same thinking on things if uh, some think it's all right to do it one way while others think it's all right to do it that way, we have to be of the same mind. We have to earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered to the saints. And once it was delivered, then it couldn't change. Paul said, I only delivered to the church which was given to me by the Lord. And we know how it was delivered. All the scholars will say that they use one cup and one loaf on the Lord's table. All of them, whether it be Methodist, whether it be Baptist, whether it be holiness, all of these scholars will say that they use one loaf and one cup on the Lord's table. And it wasn't until the 1940s and 50s that they began to change because of the invention of the microscope. You know, we may have all been drinking from one cup and one loaf today if man hadn't invented the microscope. I mean, I know it does a lot of good, but it's divided a lot of, of God's people because they've allowed themselves to believe that God can't keep them safe, that God can't keep them healthy, but he did for 1950 years. 1950 years, everybody was fine. No cases ever was linked back to the church from drinking from the one cup. But man thought that his innovation, his creation, would make it better. 
and when all it did was divide the church, separate God's people, cause them to uh, not to communicate, not to be able to communicate in the way that they used to and worship in the same way because of division. And we find Paul condemns that and those that would have, those that would uh, enter into the church, you know, he says in Acts 20 and 28, he says, watch out for grievous wolves because they come to you uh, in sheep's clothing. You know, they, they look innocent. And, but before you know it, they divide the church right down the middle. They divide the church right down the middle. Some on this side and some on this side. You know, that's what happens when innovation comes into the church. Because some want to hold fast to that which uh, 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 they can prove, while others say, you know, we've got to modernize. We've got to keep up with the times. We've got to do this and we've got to do that. And because of it, they divide the church. And because they divide the church, it no longer, it no longer is the same. Yes, those that continue to worship God in spirit and in truth, they're the same. But those who have allowed religious innovation or innovation from mankind to come into the church, they have separated God's people. And Paul, the Apostle Paul, says that this is wrong, that this is sin, and it is abomination to the Lord. He even says there, those that drink, drink, eat and drink unworthily, you know, they bring damnation to themselves. Not discerning the Lord's body. And the way that we do that is not only in our mind, but when we have crackers on the Lord's table, we can't discern the Lord's body because it's supposed to be one loaf. And when it's crackers, when it's crackers, uh, that no longer is what the Bible teaches. And you can't discern the Lord's body. That is, your mind can't focus the way that it should when you're focusing on crackers or when you're focusing on the individual cups. You know, it doesn't represent the one blood. And when we do that, the Bible says we're hurting our own selves. We're hurting our own selves because our mind can't focus the way that it should. We can't remember the way that we should. And then, no longer are we walking by faith. No longer are we walking by faith. We might think that we are, but we're not contending for what was given through the apostles to the church. And when we do that, we are like uh, Cain that tried to offer something unto God that he didn't authorize. Like Nadab and Abihu, they tried to offer something that, uh, what, that unto God that was strange. Well, I can tell you, individual cups and crackers are strange. They are strange when you, you try to offer them to God. And it is something God has not authorized. And we need to be careful about innovations. We need to be careful about things that man thinks is all right, but the Bible says is wrong. Because we need to be of the same mind and the same judgment following the teachings of God. And remember that all scripture is from the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect when it comes to worshiping God. The word perfect means complete. It means complete. It means a mature state. And that we ourselves, we want to worship God in a way that's complete or a way that God authorized and that we have matured to the point that we understand that we cannot offer unto God something that he has not authorized and it be all right. You know, 
This is the pattern which God has authorized. And as Christians, when we drink from that one cup, we're showing God that we want to offer to him something that he has authorized, something that he has ordained, something that he has allowed his son to shed his blood for. And because of it, we find that we are to continue in that pattern. We're to continue to obey God and not to allow ourselves to be deceived. We find in Hebrews 9, 11 through 15 where it says, But Christ being come a high priest of good things to come by greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats cast, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained an eternal redemption for us. For the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of heifers, sprinkling of the unclean, sanctified to the purifying of the flesh. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who the eternal spirit offered himself without spot unto God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? And for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament, that means by death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were made under the first testament, they were which our call might receive the promise of an eternal, uh, eternal inheritance. So we see here that Jesus is the authorized this new covenant through his blood. And those that uh, uh, partake of this, those that uh, are under this new covenant, we find we are uh, his blood ratified made good, made holy, and he says that that first one would have been all right. There would have never been any need to sell up for a second one. But we find that there is one that is more holy, more right in the eyes of God. This is what we are to obey. And it's sad to say that many today, for some reason or another, have a hard time in seeing that. But one brother said that, uh, he said that uh, as far as the innovation, the individual cups, he said, I had rather be the man that pierced the side of Jesus than be the one that invented the individual cups that divided the church. You know, that's how serious this is. That's how serious this is, and that's how serious we need to... Uh, uh, remember this and not uh, ever allow ourselves to be deceived into thinking that this can be changed, that this can be made better or more holy or more right because it can't. You know, maybe there's one here today that knows that their life is not right, knows that they're, they've not lived the way that they should. The Bible says you need to come back. You need to make your life right with God by confessing uh, that you've allowed the world to darken your life and separated you from sin, as we find in uh, uh, Isaiah 59, 1 and 2, where Isaiah writes, Your sins have separated you from God. But those who have never obeyed the gospel, the Bible says that we need to hear. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God in Romans 10 and 17. We need to believe with all of our heart that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, as it says in John 8 and 24, and in Mark 16, 15 and 16, where it says, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. We also find in Luke 13 and 3 and 13 and 5, where it tells us we must repent, that we must change. That means if you're going in one direction and you know that you're going in the wrong direction, you change that direction. And you start going in the way that is right. Then he says that we must be willing to confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God in Matthew 10, 32 and 33, where Jesus said, If you will confess me before men, I will confess you before my Father in heaven. But he said, If you deny me before men, I will deny you before my Father in heaven. Then he says in Acts 2 and 38, the people there wanted to know what to do because they were pricked in their hearts. They realized that they were the ones that had had Jesus crucified. They were, they were concerned about their souls. And Peter said, repent, every one of you, and be baptized. Every one of you, for the remission of your sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. 
for the gift is not only to you, but to uh, as many as our Lord will call. Listen, if God is calling you this morning through his word, and that's the way that he calls today is through his word. If he is calling you, why don't you come while we stand and sing the song of invitation. Who at my door is standing patiently Anybody else here that wants to make things right, that they feel that they're not right, right now is a great time to come because the Bible tells us today is a day of salvation. Harden not your heart. The Lord can come back today, next week, next month, but the best thing we can do is be prepared. And uh, if we're prepared, we're going to be able to sleep at night, rest, get our eight hours, and be ready to go the next day. But if we are uneasy about our soul, then we will never rest the way that we want to. But uh, we're so thankful for Janet and her desire to come forward.
every day. That's as well as she has countless fathers to do that. We ask, Father, that you restore her back to the family of God, that she would be as white as snow and pure as the angels in heaven. This we ask in Jesus' name. And amen. now come to another part of the worship service We're taking the Lord's Supper they were here prepared we have one loss and one cup as the Bible says we will follow this to you you are not there let us clear our minds of all things and remember Christ the sacrifice he made for us let us pray our Father we ask you to bless your bread to us Christians the body of Christ sacrifice on the cross We'll look up at Charles and remember that sacrifice. We will listen well now. Let's be here. God's name we pray. Amen. They won't be over there.
been uh, great to be here this morning and be with my brothers and sisters here at uh, Chestnut Ridge. I'll just tell you that uh, over at uh, Yellow Banks, you know, I stood in the kitchen and preached to the people in the dining area. I'll tell you what, I didn't preach but about 30 minutes because I could smell food. And, uh, that, I'd do it to you every time. And uh, I was watching the weatherman and he was saying, everybody go out and get your milk and bread. And I said, well, what do you eat when, you, when it's not snowing? Most people have milk and bread all the time as far as I know. But, uh, but th this is from Peachy, and I think everybody knows that her husband James passed away this week, and uh, she sent this card, and uh, she said, to my sweet church family, thank you all for all that the, the delicious food you all brought to us. Thanks also for your prayers, visits, calls, also for the candle. It was beautiful. I miss you all so much. Keep us in your prayers. Love, Peachy, and family. And uh, I know that uh, uh, she would love to be here with us. Hopefully one day she'll get to where she can come and worship with us and uh, be able to uh, uh, commune and pray and sing at, as the Bible teaches that uh, we are able to do uh, if we're able. We're so thankful for Janet and her uh, commitment to the Lord and trying to live her life, even in a world sometimes that uh, uh, is, it's hard to do. And uh, but we're very thankful for her uh, courage and her desire to do what's right in God's side. And uh, we all need to uh, tell her how thankful we are for her example of courage and commitment to the Lord. So uh, uh, let's remember that. Remember our service here Wednesday night. And hopefully uh, I'll be teaching again. We'll be looking at Ephesians 6, 6 through 8, and it talks about employees and employers, or master and servants uh, back in the day. But uh, it's real interesting, and if you can make it here, uh, I know that uh, uh, you'll enjoy being here with us. So uh, remember that. Remember to pray for all those that are on the prayer list. Remember our service next Lord's Day in the morning. Brother Philip is going to try to be here if everything works out in London, and uh, here be with us to speak. Most been here today, but uh, his backup uh, has uh, kind of a snowbird, and uh, he was afraid to get out. So, uh, but uh, uh, hopefully he'll be able to be with us this Lord's day. But uh, let's continue to pray for one another, do all that we can for the cause of Christ, and uh, we'll stand and sing the first and last verse, number seventy-seven. Be dismissed in a word of prayer, number seventy-seven. <clears throat> My heavenly 